it, it was funny transition to the sheriffs. Um, it's not, you know, policing isn't military and it's a dog eat dog world. You get there, you know, I'm leaving the army as a sergeant major with all these quals and armed combat instructor. And I just get qualified and they need, Hey, we need names for the defensive tasks constructor. I'm like, I'll do it. They're like, no, you just got here. You can't do it. Right. <laughs> and then the rest of the guys are like, I, I don't want to do that course. Cause then that means more obligations. You have to go and teach. Right. That, you know, they're not as keen as the army guys. So then they force a the guy on and Of course he didn't want to do it. And then he gets injured and that unit didn't get an instructor. <laughs> wow. So what I did, as I always do, even in the army, I pay for courses on my own. Sure. Yeah. I, I took leave and paid for that course. And I was on the same course as the sheriffs. Oh my and God. I paid out of my own pocket. Wow. To make it happen. Anyways. But well, no, that, that's, that's kind of how it is in the States too, bro. When I have my battle line courses, a lot of the cops, they're paying on their own dime. Yep. They, they, we don't and to better themselves I, that, that just sounds so familiar to what goes on it, in the it really is man. Wow. it's very similar uh, i think the problems in even in militaries and policing around the world it's the same issues um but for executive protection so i did the minimum of two years uh patrol task and the guy running the executive protection and i only joined the sheriffs to go to executive protection that was okay. my goal right that's what i had in my mind i'm gonna get there and that's what i'm doing so the guy running the unit used to be the staff sergeant running the Edmonton Police Tactical Unit. This guy's a legend. He's okay. just phenomenal. He rewrote that entire package there. So he's bringing the premier downstairs one day and he sees me. He's like, Tim, I'm like, John, he's like, what are you doing here? I'm like, retired. He goes, I'm like, what are you doing here? Retired. All right. So he goes, we'll talk. Nice. And uh, so I got drafted up there immediately. And um, so work my ass off all these extra hours. We don't get overtime for extra hours. And I just went into that recon mindset of us go, go, go. We're working 18 hour days, one meal a day and dehydrated. Cause you never know when you can go to the washroom <laughs> and right. And we're dealing with a very, very difficult principle. <laughs> um, so, you know, like in the army, we, we have c control, even in battle, you kind of have that control. Yeah, At that particular principle, there was no control. There was nothing that nothing happened. Like everything was out of your, your mission statement. And it was so frustrating. Did she but, think she needed you guys? Was she that kind of principle that she really felt that you guys were a burden uh, and she burden. didn't need the protection? I, 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 I'm i asking because I Total burden. been there, man. I understand. How did you work around that without literally I, 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 wringing her neck and, and so hard to do and all people and the guys that are coming up to understand this, that the restraint, the, 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 the integrity that you have to have to work for somebody like that. Can you go through that a little bit and what went yeah. through your head and maybe in one of your worst days, how did you get through that? Where you just, you know, it, a lot was done. talking each other off the edge. Um, like my, my, well, retired now, but my still my current boss, he's a superintendent now in charge of protect all of protective services. And he always is like, he's like, Gunny, thanks for talking me off that ledge. I wouldn't be here right now, man. And he didn't have a military background. He just had policing. So, um, you know, I gave him that, you know, good military talk one night at midnight as we're watching her drink, drink herself to death. Um, <laughs> and you're bored as hell. <laughs> so yeah, you just, you just work through it. And the funny thing is, um, she got fired two and a half years into her term. That's why I went through so many bloody premiers, but she actually saved my job. So as much as I hated her and she was horrible, if she was so bad that even the cleaners in the, in the legislature wouldn't come in the wing, she affected the people all of them. But anyways, so I was only seconded to the unit and, uh, and then Bruce, who was in charge of the unit at the time, um, he was the superintendent. He calls me in the office and this is just after we just did the big election cycle. And I'm like, I know where this is going. He goes, yeah, you know, Tim, you're doing a great job, but the position is going to be given to Calgary, the other city that's south of us. So they have a south and north team. And inside, I'm just like, motherfucker. <laughs> I'm just like, hey, Roger that. Bruce understood, you know, um, really enjoyed my time here. And if the position comes up, love to have it here. 
And it's like, yeah, hey, you know, appreciate that. And then I leave the room all disgruntled, like, ah, got to go back to patrol. So <laughs> the very next day, I'm gearing up and uh, I'm in the hallway and the premier comes in. Okay. But now I'm in a hard uniform. And she goes, Tim, I'm like, morning, premier. She goes, what are you doing? I'm like, this is my job. Literally 10 minutes later, I get a phone call. Go take your shit off and come report. <laughs> she called the chief directly and went, I want this guy in my unit. Well, so, you, obviously you had a positive effect on her or she, at least she, she knew that you were, and that says a lot for your, 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 your moral courage, dude, and your integrity is that it's hard to want to take a bullet for somebody like that. But obviously she recognized that. So I, right. I, I mean, or, or, and maybe you just would get, bring her more whiskeys than the other. I don't know. Well, it's just, <laughs> what it's the fact it? that I was very Sergeant Majory, very whoop, roger that yeah. and got her in, in that mode and yeah. no emotion. No. Um, but the, the, the bad side of it was, is I ended up being one of her favorites. So I was always the team leader bodyguard and I never got a break going on advances. Like if you're on advance team, at least you're not around her. Yeah. Right. Yep. And, That's yep. funny. No, no, you, you're right. You, you get there yeah, you, and then you can kind of disappear and until the end of the night and then maybe do the QRF on the way back or wherever. Yeah. I know I, I feel you, but if you're that yeah. PSO or that, bodyguard right that the, the, the whatever you want to call it they're calling now man yeah you you get no breaks and you are not just a protector but in some instances and i've seen that and i've even been part of that been taken advantage of you become kind of a chogi boy a little bit too yeah and it, that sucks that's it terrible. Does. it's it awful does. and and you become that confident you know, yeah you know, like if she was always needy and always wanted her someone around her at all times so if the ea wasn't around and I'm, you know, in my positioning, then as soon as he would leave, then I would position up so she could talk. Yeah. Right. And then as soon as that person's back in the picture, you're nothing again, and you're back here. <laughs> so I was taking her into Afghanistan and the team, the other team had her in India. So I linked up in India to do transition there and then gave them their medical training and safety briefs. And then in Afghanistan, we weren't going to be armed. We were going to fly there and have Canadian forces, uh, Executive okay. protection team as okay. our guys, and gotcha. I'm like, damn, I'm going back to Afghanistan with no gun. This sucks. <laughs> so, anyways, uh, after I did the bit of T Triple C with these guys, uh, with the chief of staff and all her peeps, uh, they were like, you know, wide eyed now and listening, right? <laughs> so the next day, what had happened was an IED took out three Canadian civilian NGOs wow. uh, in the area that we were going to visit. So they called it off. But I explained to them, I said, well, look, this is rare that what's going to happen to us. You know, we should push forward. So I have to say they, that was the only good decision she made because I didn't, I looked at that as an army guy, like, Hey, you know, this isn't going to affect us. We're going to push on. But politically it was like, well, how's it going to look if I show up a day after two, three Canadians were killed and I'm here like, Hey, look at me, everybody. So yeah. that was a good thing. But the, <laughs> The problem for me was at that point, I lost the rest of my team. And it's like now, because we were going, because after Afghanistan, we were going to Switzerland. Okay. To hand off to that team. But guess what? Now we're not going to Afghanistan. Oh, let's go do an impromptu in London. No advance, no team members. Wow. And I was like, I, 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 the, 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 having a good security officer like yourself. Uh, and I hate to say it, but it, it makes the protectee get that nonchalance that I'm safe everywhere. But in your head, you're not, that just makes your job harder because now you're having to scramble and protect them, even though you have no, no intel, no, and no advance. That's awful. Having no advance, nobody there. Oh, and, you're just I, and I, I didn't know what hotels were going to, because now it was her people booking everything. Not and they don't think of security. Everything. They don't think of security. They no. think of five-star restaurants. Where's the best bars? Maybe if they're a clubber, where's the best places to go hang out? And they yeah. don't think anything about security or traffic or even just traffic, just getting yeah. around how <laughs> to times. They don't think nothing about it. And because this was an unofficial visit, we had no embassy support either. So it, wow. I was literally on my own. And <laughs> so we're in the airport waiting for our bags. The executive assistant, P, myself, and the chief of staff. 
And you know what London's like. It's, it's There's not many of us looking people there, right? <laughs> we get our bags, dress nice, and we're going down the hallway to go to the taxis. And then I'm hearing the board of security, sir, sir. I'm like, Ugh. turn around. I'm like, yeah, what do you need? And she just book and she's going and she won't stop for you. So I'm like, she's going to get in a taxi. I don't know where I'm going. I'm going to lose my principal. The premier, wait, wait, is it the premier or the chief of staff that's going premier. towards the taxi? The premier is going towards premier. the taxi. That's and, what? And, and I'm st stuck talking to border security. <laughs> and we were waiting for bags to like the last minute. And, you know, the cameras are on you. So how did you pick me as the security issue? Did you have a long shirt on? If you did, maybe that was it. I did. I was in a suit. Oh, yeah. I, mean, I, I, I don't know. So I don't know. Like, anyways. And I hate badging when I don't have to badge. And she's just going. And she's like a double fast walker. So I'm just like, boom. This is who I am. This is what's going on. And I'm out of here. And he's like, oh, sorry, sir. And off I went. Uh, but anyways, the rest of the story worked out great. Uh, she was actually pleasant. And we just toured London. And then once the executive assistant was back, uh, it was uh, it was a nightmare again. And then, wow. <laughs> then I, I wanted to I, I wanted to ask you about something in regards to executive protection. I, I've been meaning to ask, and I want to make sure I get it in here. What, you, will you you know very graciously and I appreciate sent me a lot about your background, and and so I felt very well prepared to have you on. But you sent me a few photos, and there's a photo of you right next to Prime Minister Ju Justin uh, Trudeau. I figure that has something to do with executive protection. Yeah. I need to know the story behind that one. So, um, so I'll, the province I live in now is British Columbia. I'm on a Vancouver Island and it's just beautiful out here. And I lived in Alberta. So Prairie Boys, we're the third largest oil reserve in the world. Wow. Right. So we're basically a superpower that the government, government will not let us be one. So we have a lot. That's why we fly around the world a lot because of our oil. And, and that's our, and our strategic uh, security issue as well. Right. That's why we're yeah. so well um, secure with our premier. So we link up a lot with the prime minister's detail there, there are CMP Royal Canadian Mounted Police. Um, okay. So, you know, just do your coordination. So that, that particular picture is with another female premier, premier Notley. And uh, so we linked up with his detail and off we went. So that's that, that particular picture. Um, so that's always fun dealing with that, <laughs> but funny story, uh, I'm the number one and I link up with their number one and we have these in Canada paratroopers. We get our jump wings here okay. yeah, yeah. and he sees my two commando tattoo and my son has his jump wings with his unit three VP and the number one with, uh, Trudeau, he's got a set of wings. But he sees the two commando, which is, you know, before his time. And he goes, are you Nick Turner's dad? I'm like, yes, I am. I'm like, how do you know Nick? And he goes, we served together in Afghanistan. I'm like, holy shit, this is a small world, you know? <laughs> I, yeah, I, I tell you, I, it, it, to me, it, it, it's.